We're not talking about the marginal benefits that come from tweaking the existing system. We're talking about a new system. Mm -hmm. Dramatically less consumption of energy right, and less extraction of resources from the world. That's the bottom line. And again, I don't have a, a nice glib answer about how we're going to achieve that. <coughs> I don't know. But I do know that if we don't start talking about it, if we don't start engaging it, not just at, at this level in small groups, but at a, a national level and an international level, it's game over. I don't think there's any way to imagine transcending this if there is not, within a relatively short amount of time, a serious national conversation. Now, I'm upbeat and hopeful because I think in the 2012 Republican Convention, this is going to be square right in the middle. That was a joke. I was kidding. <laughs> People are, really? I didn't know the Republicans were taking this up. I'm not, no, no, they're not. Here's the second half of the joke. I also think this is going to be on the agenda at the 2012 Democratic. <laughs> Certainly, many people come to the United States, immigrants come to the United States, coming from places where the, the minimal sort of material success that we might take for granted here is hard to achieve and, and having a chance to achieve that here. And I don't denigrate that. As I said, my grandfather did that, and, and it's a serious part of my own history, although in a very different way. But I think that to leave that as the American dream and to leave that narrative of the dream uncritiqued is dangerous. <clears throat> the first part of it is, why are people coming to the United States to achieve the good life? Are, are Mexican immigrants, whether documented or not, coming because they hate Mexico? Because Mexico is an inherently inferior place? No, they're being driven to the United States because the economic conditions in a place like Mexico very much conditioned on decisions made in Washington and New York is driving them there. So coming to achieve the American dream is in part necessary because the American dream has destroyed the possibility of a Mexican dream. And we've got to sort of keep that front and center. And beyond that, whatever the case may be, People coming to achieve that kind of material success in the United States are adding to the long-term problem. Maybe as a, an analogy, imagine there's a train right, heading, you know, steaming forward. And the dining car is well stocked. It's nice and warm. Everybody wants to get on the train. Can't blame you. You're sitting by the side of the, of the road. The train comes by. You want to get on. The problem is the train is on a set of tracks that are heading to the cliff. And independent of how many people get on, that, that train is going over the cliff. And that's the other reality. And as long as these American Dream narratives are so deeply set in place, I think it's harder to deal with these kinds of things honestly. Both the, again, the questions that revolve around social justice and the questions that revolve around ecological sustainability. That doesn't mean that we have to, I'm not arguing that we mock or denigrate those people who embrace it. I'm arguing that we engage in a conversation that tries to raise these critical questions. The point is well taken that when we use metrics like half the world's population lives on less than 250 a day, are we implying that everyone should be seeking money as a way to create the good life? And of course I'm not trying to make that argument. But the fact is very few people in this world live outside the global capitalist economy. And that $2.50 a day is not meant to imply everybody should be trying to get rich. It's just meant to be a rough marker of the conditions under which people live. It is true that some people, especially those who can live to the degree possible outside that global economy, can offset the lack of money with other kinds of cultural goods strong kinship networks and family and traditions. That's all true. Thank you. But on the other hand, how many people really live outside of that is the question. Let me take as an example uh, India. Uh, later in the spring, on April 5th and 6th, uh, a leading Indian journalist named Sainath will be in town and he'll be speaking about his research on the collapse of the rural economy in India. Most of India is still rural, still peasant farming. 
And by peasantry <coughs> means small scale farming. All right. Now, those are village systems in which those kinds of traditions, kinship, and, and cultural resources exist, but they still have to survive in this global economy. And the, the statistics are quite stunning. There, it's something like three quarters of the Indian population lives on less than 50 cents a day. Now, you can, you know, and I'm not suggesting you're saying this, but you could say, well, but it's being offset by other cultural traditions. Well, unfortunately, it's not. And in fact, Sainath's work on the collapse of the rural economy began when he started noticing a steady increase in the number of farmers committing suicide. Farmers who would go into debt to buy the inputs and not be able to recover the costs, and then, driven to despair, would commit suicide, often, ironically and tragically, by drinking the pesticide that they'd had to borrow to buy. Well, in the past decade, something like 200,000, let me repeat, 200,000 Indian farmers have committed suicide as a result of this global capitalist economy, you know, driving their commodity prices down while input prices are high and the, the debt they fall into leaves them in that kind of despair. So that's the reality of the world. Right? The, the quest isn't to, to make everybody into a nice middle-class American who keeps an eye on their, their 50, no, what do you call those? 401ks, excuse me. I almost said 501c3. <laughs> but IRS, you know, status for one of the nonprofits, anyway. I just think it's a rough measure of the, the real despair in which most of the world lives and that we have to be aware of. Uh, we're seeing large numbers of people in the United States who were raised with the expectation that the, the, the material part of the dream, especially, would be available. I, the story is often told that every generation believed that their children were going to have more, and easier access to more than they had had. And all of a sudden, that is no longer the case. So what happens? Well, as you say, what happens is rather predictable. In a culture with no consistent left organizations, ideology, and traditions, that anger and resentment at elites who have created a system that no longer serves the needs of ordinary people are not likely to be directed into a deep left critique of capitalism and empire. If the institutions aren't there, the ideology isn't there, why would one expect people to automatically move to what we believe to be the correct left interpretation? Where will they go? They'll go to the place where the ideology is well developed and the institutions exist and are well funded, which is a right-wing critique. Now, that, you know, in some ways is very depressing, but I think we also have to ask the question, how long can that continue? How long can relatively elite right-wing forces sell to a population that they should get to be more right-wing to solve their problems, right? when it is, in fact, the right-wing ideology that is the basis for the problem? Uh, how long can that continue? Well, in a well-developed propaganda system that we have in the United States, propaganda meaning educational institutions, media institutions, and often the church, well, that can go on for quite some time. And, and what scares me is that even if eventually we imagine that we can turn the tide, how long do we have to really make serious inroads? Uh, and I think what this brings up is the question of fascism. Uh, throughout most of my time of being politically active, I've listened to people, usually younger people, angry, for justifiable reasons, describe the United States as a fascist society. You know what I'm talking about, you know, really. U.S. is a fascist state, man. U.S. is a fucking police state, man. Okay, well, guess what, it's not. <laughs> the United States is not a fascist state, and it's not a police state. <laughs> If you have doubts, call my friend from Turkey, who used to do left labor organizing in Turkey when it really was a fascist police state. She said this at a, uh, I digress, she said this at a, a meeting we had once. Some guy got up and started ra railing on about the U.S. being a police state. She said, excuse me, sir, I've lived in a police state. This isn't one. 
Right? It doesn't mean that the police power of the country isn't used to target specific people. Of course it is. I mean, that's why the jails are disproportionately black and brown. Right? But we are not a fascist state. Not in any way in which fascism is a meaningful term in political science. Right? And I would argue over and over again, we live in a liberal, pluralist, capitalist democracy which is very good at social control. But that form of social control is very different than fascism. Okay? It doesn't mean it's a good situation. It means it's different. And when you conflate the two, I think you lose analytic power and therefore you lose any hopes of, of, of making inroads in the population. All that said, I'm worried about the United States turning fascist. I don't think it is, but I think that that possibility is not inconceivable. And I think we do have to think about that. And that means that our organizing has to constantly, even though I, I said I don't think this is a mass movement moment, I think we do have to start wherever we can connecting to people and trying, if not bringing them into a, a left progressive viewpoint, at least trying to blunt the effect of that incredibly effective right-wing propaganda. The U.S. emergence on the world stage as an imperial power we know is not new, but it did take on new levels, especially after World War II. And I think the question is how to think about that in the scope of U.S. history, and how to think about the relation of that to what we now enjoy, the levels of material comfort we now enjoy. And in one of the books I did called The Heart of Whiteness, I talked about the three racialized holocausts in U.S. history that make our lifestyle today possible. The first we talked about already, the near extermin complete extermination of indigenous people. The second one I made brief reference to, the, the African slave trade, which helped propel the United States into the industrial world and make us a player on the world stage in a new way, moving from an agrarian to an urban and industrialized society. The third which you're referring to is the post-World War II assault on the developing world, which has a racial character to it. The vast majority of societies targeted by the U.S., of course, being non-white, and the ease with which U.S. policymakers could rally support for horrendous crimes, no doubt related to the fact that the, the victims were predominantly non-white. Those are racialized holocausts, and I use that term quite specifically, millions of bodies, whole societies devastated, that make it possible for us to live the way we do. And we've got to come to terms with that. The other somewhat connected point, when you're talking about, you know, poor and working class white folks who are now responding in anger and often targeting, you know, the wrong folks in the sense of targeting those who are vulnerable, not those who are responsible. One of the things I've been thinking about is this term white trash. You hear this as a term used for poor and working class white people. They're just white trash. Well, take that term, white trash. If you are white trash, you know, maybe, you know, I'm from North Dakota. Maybe you're thinking, well, that's all of North Dakota. It's all white, it's all trash. But, all right, if I'm white trash, I have two choices. I can identify as white and try to place myself in the pantheon of white and magically grab what I currently do not have, or I can embrace the trash and say, yeah, I'm trash. I'm trash in the sense that this society labels a whole bunch of people as trash, and my ability to improve the quality of my own life is going to be in banding together with other trash and <laughs> elevating ourselves. Right? And this is hardly a new idea. I mean, people often remind us that when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, he was organizing or helping organize a poor people's campaign, multiracial, that this is one of the dreams of the radical left for a long time, not always deployed very successfully. And so how we think about ourselves in these very basic ways, I think, are also important. Now, you made some reference to my uh, depressing uh, remarks or uh, despair perhaps but I don't know I think it might say, in North Dakota I pass as upbeat and cheery <laughs> where I come from I'm laugh a minute you know I'm the life of the party in North Dakota tells you something about the nature of parties in North Dakota perhaps 